Space is not cold. It is nothing. A vacuum that cannot carry warmth away and yet can drain it with ruthless precision. On the moon, sunlight can bake a surface to more than 250 degrees Fahrenheit, while a few feet away, in shadow, temperatures plunge below minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. For the men of Apollo, those numbers weren't abstract physics. They were life or death. Inside the fragile aluminum shell of the lunar module, there was no air to carry heat, no wind to cool machinery, and no convection to even out the temperature. The spacecraft had to regulate its own heartbeat, keeping humans alive and instruments stable, all without an atmosphere to help. And it did so with water, ice, and a quiet miracle of engineering called the sublimator. In silence, it turned heat into vapor and survival into routine. The Lunar Module, built by Grumman in Bethpage, New York, was the first true spacecraft designed only to operate in a vacuum. It carried no fuel cells, no radiators, no external heat sinks. Everything had to be managed internally through the Environmental Control Subsystem, or ECS. Within that system, the heat transport section was the spacecraft's circulatory system, a network of pumps, valves, and tubes that carried liquid coolant wherever heat appeared. The problem was unforgiving. Electronics, guidance computers, and life support machinery generated constant heat, while the external skin of the module alternated between searing sunlight and the cold of space every orbit. On Earth, an engineer might use air cooling or radiators, but in a vacuum, radiators can only reject a limited amount of heat, and their effectiveness drops when the external temperature changes. NASA's answer was simple, elegant, and radical. Sublimation, the direct conversion of ice to vapor. Instead of boiling water, the system froze it and let the vacuum of space pull the heat away as steam. No moving parts, no pumps beyond the existing loops, no risk of fluid loss to the environment. Just water, metal, and physics working in harmony. This would become one of the most reliable systems ever flown on Apollo. Inside the lunar module, heat was not wasted, it was managed. The Heat Transport Section, or HTS, used two independent coolant loops, a primary and a secondary system. Each carried a liquid mixture of 65% water and 35% ethylene glycol, a corrosion-inhibited solution similar to automotive antifreeze, but far purer. The loops operated at a nominal flow rate of 250 pounds per hour, driven by small brushless pumps located in the cabin. Their job? Keep the spacecraft's temperature between about 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, despite the outside extremes. The primary loop flowed through the suit heat exchanger and the low temperature electronics cold plates, cooling astronaut breathing gas and delicate avionics in parallel. Next, it passed through the liquid-cooled garment heat exchanger, a set of metal coils that chilled the water circulating through the astronaut's undersuits and then across the high-temperature electronics cold rails. Every electronic box had its own flow path, with carefully sized orifices ensuring the right thermal balance. From there, the coolant traveled to the sublimator, where its collected heat was rejected into space before returning through a filter to the pump inlet. The secondary loop mirrored this arrangement, 
except it bypassed the primary guidance and navigation equipment and had only a single pump. Both loops were cross-connected through isolation valves for redundancy, a lesson learned from earlier spacecraft where a single leak could end a mission. Even the astronauts' suits were part of the system. When connected to the cabin ECS, the same coolant that flowed through the module's walls also cooled the men themselves, via tubing woven into their liquid-cooled garments. During high workloads, lunar EVA, equipment setup, or ascent preparation, this personal cooling network removed more than 1,200 BTUs per man per hour. It was life support turned engineering art. The heart of the lunar module's thermal control system was the sublimator, a device so simple it defied expectation. At first glance, it resembled a small metal drum, layers of porous nickel plates separated by coolant channels. When water entered, it froze within the microscopic pores on the vacuum side. As the coolant circulated on the other side, heat passed through the plate, turning the ice directly into vapor. That vapor escaped to space, carrying heat away with every molecule that left. No moving parts, no thermostats. The sublimator adjusted its own rate automatically. The warmer the coolant, the faster the ice sublimated. But designing it was anything but simple. Early models suffered from brazing defects that blocked pores and reduced performance. Engineers discovered that the direction of the metal's internal grain mattered. The finer pore face had to be oriented toward the steam passage, otherwise vapor flow would choke the system. They increased fin density inside the coolant passages, welded rather than brazed the metal, and switched to higher permeability plates. Another issue came from chemistry. NASA initially used chlorine as a water sterilizer, but chlorine left a residue on the porous surface that depressed the freezing point and caused water breakthrough, liquid leaking into the steam passage and freezing solid. Tests showed that iodine was safe and clean, and all later missions used iodinated water. Sublimators were stored in dry nitrogen to prevent corrosion during manufacturing and checkout. Performance was tested and then derated for flight to account for natural degradation over time, ensuring that even after months in storage, each sublimator would exceed mission requirements. During flight, they performed flawlessly. From Apollo 9 through Apollo 11 and beyond, the LM sublimators met or surpassed all predicted performance curves. When Armstrong and Aldrin stood on the moon, their spacecraft was quietly venting heat through ice that never melted, a machine breathing frost into space. The coolant that coursed through the LM's veins seemed ordinary, water mixed with ethylene glycol. But its exact chemistry became one of the most subtle and critical issues in the entire program. Initially, engineers borrowed the same formula used in the command and service module, 62.5% glycol and 37.5% water, with small additions of triethylenomine triphosphate and sodium mercaptobenzothiazole as corrosion inhibitors. However, testing revealed that the LM needed a higher specific heat capacity to handle varying thermal loads. 
the mixture was adjusted to 35% glycol and 65% water, raising its heat capacity from 0.72 BTU per pound degree Fahrenheit to 0.86 BTU per pound degree Fahrenheit. The change also raised the freezing point from minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit to about minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit, not a problem since the system never operated that cold. For four years, the formula worked perfectly, until June 1969, just before Apollo 11. Routine sampling from the LM5 coolant lines revealed a startling sight. The fluid was full of fine crystalline particles. Investigations showed that a supplier had replaced the commercial-grade corrosion inhibitor with a higher purity chemical. In doing so, they had inadvertently removed a trace stabilizer, sodium sulfite, only 0.018% of the total mix, that prevented the compound from decomposing. Without it, the compound broke down into disulfide crystals floating through the coolant. Tests showed the crystals were soft and passed easily through pumps and orifices. Filtering them out only delayed their return. Bench trials proved the pumps could survive thousands of hours with no abnormal wear. Rather than delay Apollo 11, NASA flew the vehicle with crystals still present. The mission was a complete success. Afterward, engineers reverted to the earlier commercial-grade inhibitor, intentionally reintroducing those trace impurities that kept the fluid stable. In the end, chemistry, as much as mechanics, became part of Apollo's learning curve. As the coolant heated and cooled, its volume changed. To keep system pressure steady, engineers designed a water glycol accumulator, a flexible diaphragm chamber that absorbed expansion and contraction. It looked simple, two hemispherical shells with a rubber diaphragm between them. But getting it to seal was difficult. Irregularities in the molded diaphragm led to leaks, and the flange grooves had to be resized. Engineers increased torque on the retaining ring only to crack it under stress. Eventually, the ring material was upgraded from aluminum 2024-T4 to 7075-T7351, thicker and resistant to stress corrosion. This solved the problem but only after a year of redesigns. The accumulator also played a critical role in preventing sublimator breakthrough. In early designs, the backup coolant loop shared a pressure interface with the water supply through a puncture disc. If the pressure rose too high, water glycol could seep into the sublimator feed line, lowering the freezing point and allowing liquid water to flood the steam ducts instantly freezing them solid. This happened during vacuum tests on the Lunar Test Article 8. The result was catastrophic failure of the secondary cooling system. Engineers responded decisively. They deleted the puncture disc and installed a dedicated accumulator for the secondary loop. From that day forward, the two systems were isolated. No shared fluids, no cross-contamination, no risk it was an elegant fix born from a hard lesson. In spacecraft, even molecules must stay in their lane. Despite its reliability, the coolant system had quirks. The small centrifugal pumps that circulated the glycol produced rhythmic pressure pulses roughly 10 psi in amplitude and 400 hertz in frequency, four pulses for every revolution of their 6,000 RPM impellers. Inside the thin-walled lunar module cabin, those vibrations resonated like a hum. Astronauts described it as a mechanical buzz behind the panels, 
steady but slightly shifting in tone. Tests showed the pumps themselves were quiet. The noise came from the tubing and cabin panels they excited. Because the coolant was completely de-aerated to prevent cavitation, its compressibility was low, making the system a perfect conductor of sound. NASA added small expansion devices downstream from the pumps and electrically damped the pressure-sensing transducers to remove the 400 Hz signal from telemetry. The noise remained audible, but harmless. As one engineer noted, if the pumps are humming, the crew is safe. From Apollo 5's uncrewed flight through Apollo 11's historic landing, the Lunar Module Cooling System performed without a single mission-limiting failure. Data from the Manned Spacecraft Center show that sublimator performance remained remarkably stable, matching pre-flight predictions within a few percent. No pump failures, no leaks, no overheating. Even on Apollo 11, with crystalline coolant and improvised last-minute flushes, temperatures in the cabin and equipment bays stayed perfectly within design limits. The sublimators handled everything, lunar sunlight, shadow, and ascent, automatically. They required no pilot input. When Armstrong and Aldrin climbed back into the lunar module after their moonwalk, their suits vented metabolic heat through the same sublimators that had protected the spacecraft all mission long. In that fragile descent stage, sitting on the Sea of Tranquility, heat flowed invisibly through the glycol loops, out through porous nickel center, and into the infinite vacuum. The engineers who built it had done more than create a cooling system. They had built a life-preserving rhythm, a mechanical heartbeat beneath the silence of the moon. The lunar module's thermal control system never made headlines. It didn't roar like a rocket, or glow like re-entry plasma. But without it, none of those moments could have existed. Its twin glycol loops and water sublimators represented the purest form of Apollo engineering. Simple, reliable, self-balancing, and endlessly tested. It was the quiet genius that let men breathe in a place with no air work in a place with no warmth, and live between fire and ice. When the lunar module lifted off from the moon, it left behind descent stages, footprints, and flags. But it also left a legacy, proof that in space, survival depends not only on power or thrust, but on restraint precision, and the mastery of nature's smallest forces. In the end, the engineers who conquered heat and cold didn't fight the vacuum. They learned to use it. And through their mastery, humanity found a way to stay alive where life had never been before.